Heads up folks, this is an essay about punching and kicking guys on screen, so there are going to be some scenes of pretty rough looking beatdowns from movies and games. Also, if you're one of those people who likes my work because I talk about existentialism and stuff, uh, this is an essay about punching and kicking guys. Finally, it's better on Nebula, you knew that part. I want to tell you about my favorite fight scene. It's a scene from the 2008 film Ip Man, starring legendary actor and on-screen martial artist Don Yen. It's a scene confident enough that it announces exactly what it's going to be from the very beginning. And that is exactly what happens. Ip Man is a historical drama set in the late 30s during Japan's brutal occupation of China. Historical should be put in heavy air quotes there, because other than the basic facts of the setting, most of the movie is entirely fictionalized. Ip Man was a real Chinese martial artist who practiced Wing Chun, China was occupied by Japan, most of this other stuff should be chalked up to cinematic and nationalistic imagination. But anyway, Ip Man is about to fight ten men. Sorry, it's just... It's hard to show the scene uncontextualized, because it's not just the choreography that I appreciate, although I do really appreciate it. But see, Ip Man starts the movie as a grand master. He's the most talented martial artist in his town, which is filled entirely with other martial artists. And in a fascinating inversion of how most movies do stakes, there's almost no moment in the entire film in which you expect him to lose a fight. He is simply too good. From the first fight to the last, Master Ip just wins. Wins without even exerting himself. As a character, he's also pretty much fully formed. He's polite, humble, generous with his time. His biggest problem is probably just that he doesn't spend enough time with his kid because he cares too much about helping his students. All this poses the question, how do you get interesting character moments from him? What do you do with a protagonist who's the most talented person in any room? Well, that's where the fighting comes in. Ip Man is, in the US at least, rated R, exclusively for violence, and in the first 40 minutes, this seems like a total overreaction by the MPA. The fights in this movie are light, almost cartoonish. In an early scene, an aggressive outsider shows up to the martial arts town, beats all the other masters handily, and then Ip Man easily outclasses him with a feather duster. The Kung Fu style Wing Chun is, in this movie, depicted as a largely defensive style, Master Ip easily blocking or leaning around blows and counterattacking in ways that generally look pretty mild. And then, you reach the hour mark, Ip Man yells that he wants to fight ten people, and suddenly his mild and defensive style turns into this. It's not a long scene about 90 seconds from the first strike to the last. But in that 90 seconds, the film paints a picture of what Ip Man has been holding back until now. Not only are 10 men dispatched in a minute and a half, but almost every man receives their own personal devastation, pummeled or fractured or thrown. For that reason, it's easy to split the scene up into moments. You might have seen iconic seconds of this fight, even if you've never watched the full movie. The leg break, the rolling punch. But removing these moments from the whole does the power of the scene a disservice. Any single clip removes the incredible sound design of the scene, the horrified choral soundtrack, the crunching of every blow. Any single clip decontextualizes the moment from the events immediately preceding and following it. The overwhelming rhythm of the scene is contingent on the fact that Ip Man is not simply incapacitating one guy, but ten of them in succession. And most importantly, without the rest of the movie, you can't appreciate that the scene is not just about a dude getting his leg broken, it's that Ip Man is breaking his leg. The feather duster guy, the guy who seems embarrassed to even acknowledge his own victories. It is a blindingly brutal fight, made exponentially more powerful by its contrast with so much goofy choreography. The tone of the movie did foreshadow this escalation of violence. The martial arts town from the beginning was completely occupied by the invading Japanese army. People are being oppressed, starved. Ip Man demands to fight ten men in the arena because he just witnessed a fellow master helplessly gunned down. The world has gotten darker, and so Master Ip must as well. If you wanted to be nitpicky, you could point out that 
this never really feels like a 10 on 1 fight. If you want to zoom in on background actors, you can see that a lot of them are just kind of bouncing around. You could say, why don't they all just rush him at once? I don't want to do that though. There's never any doubt that Ip Man will win this fight. The movie confirms it in literally the first second. We know he'll win. So what do we care that these 10 dudes aren't approaching him with maximum efficiency? Far more important than their tactics is the fear on their faces as they're systematically dismantled by Ip Man, each realizing that they're suddenly on the wrong side of a horror movie monster. During a practice fight in an earlier scene, Ip Man gently said, hit, hit, big hit, instead of actually striking another master. Now we see how each of those hits would have actually played out, dislocating joints and breaking bones and leaving their recipients convulsing on the ground. But out of the 11 people in this scene, there's only one who matters. These 10 black belts, who we have never seen before and will not see again, exist to be taken apart. The focus is squarely on Ip Man, who has, in his grief, turned himself into a weapon. Even the phenomenal score for the scene plays it like a tragedy. We don't experience the tension of an unsure victory, or even get to celebrate Ip Man triumphing over his ten foes. Instead, the movie gives its biggest set piece an air of mourning. It is tragic, the movie communicates, that the discipline and artistry of his kung fu has been warped into something as ugly as this. The thrill of virtually any martial arts movie is found in watching the actors perform near superhuman feats, not via camera trickery or visual effects, but simply because the actors themselves are talented enough to do things that most humans cannot. That Donnie Yen is able to harness that energy, his blinding speed and flawless choreography, and turn it into something tragic speaks to the narrative utility of these fights. This is where his character arc happens, not through conversation, but through bursts of violence. Much like a musical's characters bursting into song to communicate their heightened emotions, Ip Man uses combat to express an emotional ache its protagonist could otherwise never articulate. I've watched this scene about 400 times. It still gives me goosebumps. I want to tell you about my favorite fight scene. The game Sifu, released in 2022 by developer Slowclap, is perhaps gaming's most literal attempt at recreating the feel of a martial arts movie. Earlier titles like God Hand offer more complex combat systems, and fighting games like Tekken somewhat tie themselves to real styles of martial arts. Even Slowclap's previous game, Absolver, was an arguably more involved approach to hand-to-hand -hand combat, with many different customizable moves and the ever-evolving challenge of a real human opponent. But I haven't played anything as devoted to the overall rhythms and punctuation of cinematic fights as Sifu. Cinematic is an important word to unpack here, and I don't necessarily mean it in the Sony over-the-shoulder way. Sifu freely draws from all manner of martial arts cinema, Although the game is set in China and uses a Chinese style of kung fu, overt references from across the globe abound, from the Indonesian The Raid to the Korean Old Boy, and even our good old American boy John Wick. Writers such as Ki Hoon Chan have written about the game's shallow depiction of Chinese culture by its almost entirely non-Chinese staff. I agree. Rather than anything specifically Chinese, the game seems to be attempting to capture the cumulative DNA of a hundred movies about dudes getting their ass kicked. Sifu does not want you to simply outmaneuver the game's challenges, it wants you to gain enough mastery that your playing of the game will eventually resemble the movies it takes so much inspiration from. And this is something Sifu does exceptionally well. But at first, you have to be the one getting your ass kicked. Getting better is an inherent feature to almost any game, but rarely have I felt the stages of this improvement as acutely as when playing Sifu. Although the first level lets you more or less button mash through, I found myself completely swarmed and overwhelmed in the beginning of its second level, The Club. The level opens with a dance floor covered in enemies, all of whom basically sprint to you as soon as you have the gall to smack one. This scenario requires a level of self-control beyond simply hitting the light and heavy attack buttons, a level of self-control I simply did not have at the beginning of the game. I brute forced it, leveraging my ability to die many times while my enemies can only die once. But that's not a strategy. 
Relatively quickly, I learned to take on the dance floor like a prey animal. I would run constantly, jumping over railings and bars, trying to split up the horde. I'd use any piece of the environment to my advantage, hurling bottles at dudes or kicking ottomans to trip them up. Eventually, the crowd would thin out enough that I could jump in, take on one at a time, and run away before they could gang up on me. It was a high-effort strategy, one that took a long time and required a near-constant motion. But for me, it worked. That's not the strategy I ended with, though. What's sort of remarkable about Sifu is the better you get, the less you have to work. Later bosses, even in the same level, completely reject your ability to hit and run. Their movesets demand to be acknowledged. You can't just sprint around this guy, you have to learn the rhythm of his 1-2 delayed 3. The boss of the second level wields a staff that seems to have a range of about 50 feet, meaning there's no way to outspace him. Instead, what Sifu asks goes against all my Souls game instincts. You gotta just plant your f***ing feet. It's hard to nail down exactly when it happened. It might have been along my main story quest to get revenge, or maybe in the dozens of arena fights added post-release, but at some point, the basic enemies just started moving in slow motion. I knew exactly when their strikes would come, I knew what pattern they'd attack me in. Instead of making them chase me, I just stood and let them come, dodging and countering each of their strikes, using their numbers against them by literally tossing them into each other. This club, which was once a frenzied fight for my life, became a trivial excuse to exercise mastery. Like the actors in a martial arts movie, I knew what move my opponent would make before they even made it. By the way, I need to interrupt this to tell you about my favorite fight scene. It's from The Matrix, but it's not the dojo or even the subway one. It's just this moment here, when Neo sees The Matrix, sees the rules of the world, and suddenly doesn't have to try to block Smith's strikes. He's almost bored by it, seems to wonder why this was ever difficult. This is what it looks like for Neo to have mastered the game. God, I love it. Anyway. Sifu actually has, in some of its arena fights and as an optional modifier, the ability to turn off the enemy limiter. That is, stop the bad guys from taking turns and have them all rush you at once. It feels like an alternate version of Ip Man's 10 on 1 fight, where all the enemies act perfectly logically. Then guess what? It's not better. It's too chaotic, it robs the fights of their creativity. What Sifu and Ip Man are pursuing is a different sort of violent reality, a world in which hordes of nameless baddies are a canvas for the protagonist to depict their mastery on. Sifu lets you go from the sculpted to the sculptor, from being manipulated by your enemies to manipulating them. The entire game is wrapped up in the same fight for peak proficiency. It might crystallize at any moment, in any location. But look. My character is 20 years old. They should be at the club. I want to tell you about my favorite fighting guy. One of the wonderful things about martial arts movies is they require such a high level of physical skill that following actors from film to film is as akin to sports fandom as it is to traditional acting. Oh, I like Jason Schwartzman because he always acts good. Sure, yeah, me too. I like Jackie Chan because every time he throws himself down a building or eats fistfuls of hot peppers, that becomes part of the canon of Jackie Chan, his history of lunatic achievements leaking into every subsequent performance he gives. Typically, these performers are so talented and knowledgeable about their craft that they're not just taking direction but actively choreographing their own scenes. Check out every frame of painting seminal essay on Jackie to hear about this in greater detail. My favorite guy isn't Jackie, though, or Donnie, or Bruce. That honor goes to Yayan Ruhian, Indonesian Silat instructor, highlight of some of the most brutal movies I've ever seen, an absolute short king. Ruhian's career is inextricable from director Gareth Evans. Evans met him while filming a documentary on Silat and cast him in his next three films, Marantau, The Raid 1, and The Raid 2. Ruhian is in fact so good on screen that Evans pulls one of the ballsiest casting decisions I've ever seen from a director. In The Raid 1, Ruhian plays Mad Dog, effectively the final boss of the movie, a true force of nature, an unforgettable presence. At the end of the movie, he dies so definitively that I have to watch the scene through my fingers. And then in The Raid 2, a direct sequel, Ruhian shows up again as a completely different character, but nonetheless absolutely recognizable. It'd be like if Alan Rickman showed up in Die Hard 2 and did basically the same stuff he did in 1, 
as a guy with a different name. You know what happened when Ruhion inexplicably showed up in the raid too? I cheered. In a review of the raid one, Manola Dargis wrote that Ruhion was the standout performance, although only on screen for a fraction of the runtime. In a review of the Raid 2, Charlotte O'Sullivan wrote that when Ruhion's body starts flying through the air, you feel as if you're reading his life story. He hasn't yet had roles as hefty as the stars of the genre, but there is an energy when he's fighting that I don't think I've ever seen before. In my favorite fight of his versus Jacko, the police captain in the Raid, he captures the same fatal inevitability as Yen does in Ip Man, but through unleashed rage rather than grim determination. When he runs at Jacko, who is a full 10 inches taller than him, you believe there is nothing in the world that can stop him. Jacko repeatedly throws him, slams him into walls, chokes him, but inevitably succumbs under the never-ending rain of elbows and knees. Ruhian seems both perfectly controlled and absolutely uncontrollable, an unforgettable presence by physicality alone. Even better is learning that Ruhion, along with many of his co-stars in the raid, was primarily cast because he is literally one of the best people in the world at Silat, the style of fighting he's doing here. He was cast because no one else can do the things he's doing. That he also happens to be an absolutely magnetic screen presence? That's just the cherry on top. When he shows up alongside his fellow raid antagonists Cisep Arif Rahman and John Wick 3, using weapons from the raid, doing footwork from the raid, I think we're supposed to understand them not just as random assassins, but the guys from the raid, their legacy stretching across films, Wick paying tribute to two of the coolest dudes to ever do it. Speaking of Wick, I want to tell you about my favorite thing to think about with modern fight scenes. It's video games. Duh. Video games owe an enormous amount to cinematic violence, obviously. Sure, Sifu has the old boy hallway, but rewind 30 years and Street Fighter is pulling from Bruce Lee, Mortal Kombat from Van Damme, Punch-Out from the televised boxing matches of the 80s. What's fascinating to me now is how the loop of history is bringing that influence back around. Movie violence is increasingly shaped by the language of video games. And boy, is this obvious in John Wick. Let's start with the most blatant, the scene in John Wick 4 when the movie briefly becomes a top-down shooter. Like many of you, I pointed at the screen and yelled, Hotline Miami! The long single take, the different rooms as different arenas, the omniscience of the top-down camera seemingly lent to John as he flawlessly blasts his way through enemies he instantly knows the positions of. In fact, stop typing that comment, the scene wasn't simply inspired by Hotline Miami, but instead inspired by a game inspired by Hotline Miami, the 2019 Vresky title, The Hong Kong Massacre. By borrowing the visibility of the game's top-down perspective and its enormous muzzle flashes, this scene is remarkably legible. A gunfight where we can see action and reaction, position and reposition, all at the same time. This is, in fact, my favorite gunfight in the whole Wick franchise, which actually isn't saying a whole lot. I think shooting is the least interesting part of this gun-obsessed universe. The John Wick films try so hard to make guns interesting. They dig guns out of vaults, they buy guns with gold coins, they talk about guns like they're wine. John, take this gun, it gives you 5% poison resistance. And perhaps the most video game logic moment of the entire series, John Wick 3 introduces a new set of enemies that are nearly impenetrable to John's current arsenal. To defeat them, he needs to return to home base and create a new build structured around his enemies' weaknesses. All this to work around the fact that hand-to-hand -hand is inherently a more expressive medium to tell a story through than shooting. As the Wick series has grown, it's leaned more into punching and kicking and slashing, and that's where we get my favorite moments of character through combat. The way Reeves improvisationally uses his environment reminds me of my favorite kinds of action games, ones where beating the enemies is the bare minimum. In Wick, like in Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, encounters should be built around demonstrating style and personality through how you choose to smack dudes down. As both Bayo and Dante know, guns aren't the means, they're the flourish. As camera technology evolves and audiences grow accustomed to the visual style delivered by their consoles, 
Directors will have the ability to shoot more of their action like a video game. Should they? Boring answer, it depends. Game framing generally excludes the protagonist's face. We see backs of heads, tops of heads, barrels of guns. And simultaneously, game cameras deprioritize everyone except the protagonist because games don't usually care about the people on the other end of the gun. The ultra-utilitarian perspectives used by most games run the risk of flattening cinematic action, sucking the character and emotion out of their perfectly coordinated series of stunts. That gunfight in John Wick 4, as balletic as it is, robs the audience of Keanu's greatest asset, his face. Other movies, like the 2017 Korean flick The Villainess, have experimented with the orchestrated chaos of a first-person brawl, and found results that are simultaneously impressive, nauseating, and a little clunky. None of these ideas seem fully mastered yet, but there's clearly potential here. I am truly excited for the continued cross-pollination of these mediums that are both obsessed with how to most effectively use their violence. I want to tell you about my favorite fight scene. It's two old men, punching each other, for no reason. Because violence is frequently the only input a player can have on the world in a game, the entire structure of a game's story is typically built around having a final guy to fight. The protagonist needs to do something to resolve the story, and the only thing they're capable of doing is violence, so the final barrier to our hero's success needs to be a guy to fight. It's a tidy way to end a game, mechanical victory and narrative victory, simultaneously achieved. This is not what happens at the end of Metal Gear Solid 4. If you are simply describing the plot of the game, a nearly impossible thing to do, everything would seem to resolve at the core of Outer Haven. Snake crawls through a hallway full of microwaves, an act that almost kills him, but he survives and manages to upload a virus to the evil AI core of the ship. This is it. This was your goal. This saves the world. Great job, Snake. Mission accomplished. A big TV lady tells us we've earned our rest. We pass out. What happens next defies rational explanation. Snake groggily comes to and sees his pal Otacon tell him to just wait here while he gets a medic. Where is here? Here is the highest metal spire of Outer Haven, essentially a skyscraper on top of an aircraft carrier, hundreds of feet above the ocean. How did Otacon get Snake here? Why, after getting him here, does he have to leave to get a medic? It will never be explained. It doesn't matter. Otacon leaves and the series antagonist, a composite character named Liquid Ocelot, shows up. Where does he come from? It also doesn't matter. Liquid says a bunch of stuff. Century-old secret agreements between superpowers, philosophers, patriots, etc. Snake is barely conscious enough to hear it. Then Liquid says the only thing that really matters. The war is over. But... We still have a score to settle. Snake has since regained consciousness, not of his own volition, but because Liquid has injected him with multiple stimulants. Snake stands up. And then they fight in a cutscene. They repeatedly throw each other to the ground. Liquid takes out another stimulant, injects himself. They fight more. It's brutal. Every impact of a fist hitting someone's face is immediately followed by the sound of their head bouncing against the metal floor. Liquid tires, takes out another stimulant. He injects himself. Snake grabs it from him, sticks it in his own neck. They trade back and forth on the same needle, genetic brothers fighting for the energy they need to keep fighting. The music swells, the choreography escalates until the two men are perfectly mirroring each other. They crumple to the ground, held up only by the other's body. Two more syringes fall out of Liquid's pocket. They each pick one up, think briefly, and then inject it into each other. Each man chooses to give his opponent the strength to keep fighting. As good as the choreography in their cutscene fight is, the thrill is different than something like Ip Man. At no point in the battle between Snake and Liquid am I impressed by their technical physical prowess or wowed by the sheer things their body can do. I don't feel the presence of actual risk or the result of years of training. There are many things film can do that video games cannot. But no film can do what happens next in Metal Gear Solid 4. 
As the two men inject each other with a final shot of stimulant, their health bars each appear in the corners of the screen, colored and labeled as their characters from Metal Gear Solid 1. The first game's iconic music starts to play, Liquid takes on his fighting style from that game's final battle, even the camera swings up to replicate the perspective of the PS1 classic. And then, midway through their health bars, things change again. Music from Metal Gear Solid 2 starts to play, the camera circles more freely as it was able to do on the PS2, Liquid's name is changed to Liquid Ocelot, his moveset changes. The fight drags on, shifting to 3's UI and names as Cynthia Harrell belts out the game's iconic theme. The camera moves closer, Ocelot uses CQC, the men continue to beat the life out of each other. It's also the section in which the implicit homoeroticism of the scene becomes textual. Fail to break out of Ocelot's grab and he'll kiss you, the difference between combat and love erased for these men who've only lived as soldiers. The only way to understand this fight is as poetry. The location, the logistics, none of it works on a literal level. Even the thing they keep injecting themselves with is technically a nanomachine inhibitor, which barely makes sense because Snake just disabled all the nanomachines with the virus he uploaded to the AI. And yet the poetry of inhibiting technology, of returning solid and liquid to their original selves, is undeniable. Like the rest of Metal Gear Solid 4, the poetry of this scene is probably too long and too infatuated with itself. But as the game begs you to think about its legacy through UI and music, the text and the metatext become one. The series and Snake continuously dragged back into battle even after declaring they're done. The final section of the fist fight loses any sense of fancy choreography. As the notes of 4's title track haunt the scene, Solid and Liquid limp towards each other, each unable to avoid the other's vicious strikes. There is nothing to be won here, no catastrophe to prevent or crisis to avert. The war is over, but these two have been left behind, two men unable to grow past the violence that's defined them. Their story is their fight, even when it's irrational, even if it changes nothing. You enjoy all the killing, Liquid told us in the first game. Even at the end of everything, Snake can't escape his, our, need for a final battle. What is a fight scene? At its best, it's an explosion of violence that communicates something words cannot. Discipline warped by mourning, instincts shaped by years of practice, character as defined by movement. What the constructed worlds of art can do is give us something that cannot exist in real life. Combat without true harm, scenes in which we can consider the thematic value of the violence being performed without the moral necessity of also considering who it is being performed upon. Punches and kicks can exist as a dance, a song, a palette, a ritual, an exclamation point, a period. When Snake and Liquid see those stims and simultaneously decide to inject each other with them, it's an acknowledgement that they both live through the fight. But me? I'm here for the performance. And they say he the best to get it. He don't spit it, he reliving his life with it. He don't pivot, he straight line of sight with it. He never dull, he rhyme into the knife with it. Kid, and he passed around the price of it. Way out of your range if you're like, you just cut a check for the price of your life. And maybe I can get you a little something on a license. It. Hello, Mr. Fight Enjoyer here. While this video had about a thousand different pieces of media in it, there are actually a significant number of favorite bits of fights that didn't make it into the script, either because they were too copyrighty or too gory, or I don't have much smart to say about them other than, I love when this happens, but I'm not ready to be done talking about my favorite punches and kicks in art. And if you're not done hearing about them, I've got a whole other video filled with these moments exclusively available on Nebula. It's 30 minutes long and filled with even more violent delights. And this last scene is really a scene where my politics butt up against what I appreciate in a movie. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service that supports me and almost 200 other of the best artists, video essayists, smart writing people out there. Nebula is ad-free and full of stuff not available anywhere else. My many exclusive videos and podcasts, wholly original series that wouldn't fly on YouTube, a really good and really long new video on John and Yoko by Lindsay Ellis. You're probably thinking, sounds great. What does this cost? $100 a day? A million per year? 
See, you're way off. In fact, it's only $2.50 a month if you join at my link nebula.tv slash Jacob Geller. Personally, I'd pay that just to see another video on dudes getting punched, but you actually get everything else I talked about too. All you have to do is follow the link in the description to hear me talk about that scene in Mission Impossible 6 where they throw that freaking guy through the mirror in the bathroom. I mean, good God, what a scene! And Henry Cavill's there and he does the little all that at a 40% discount, only 30 bucks a year or $2.50 a month by going to nebula.tv slash Jacob Geller. And when they scream and instead they call, I stand tall throwing heat at them until they fall. I'm telling you, call me off, but I've been doing that. A soldier for the battle to show me where it's at. And watch me lay him down. See, we don't play around. We move it how we feel and get it by the pound. The flow got me going off of them tracks, man. It's live watch and they gotta Let's bring it back. Go. Here we go, ride. We go. Here we go. Let's go! 